Hello and welcome to a special episode of the Lighthouse podcast that is being produced by the Belgrade Center for Security Policy. My name is Predok Petrovic and I will be your host in this special episode. And this episode is special because we have a very special guest today. It is a Peter Neumann, who is a keynote speaker at this year's uh, uh, academic event uh, of the Belgrade uh, Security Forum that is completely dedicated to resilience to violent extremism. And we wanted actually to use this unique opportunity to have a conversation with uh, Peter. Peter has a uh, very extensive, very vast experience um, in researching uh, of extremism. Uh, if I'm not wrong, Peter has over two decades of, um, uh, of res researching uh, extremism and terrorism. And he's currently a professor of security studies at the Department of uh, War Studies at the King's College London where he also served as a director of International Center for the Study of Radicalization. But he also has um, experience in, um, in, um, in, uh, in consulting uh, international organizations such as OSC. He served as a special representative on countering violent uh, radica radicalization. And now Peter is also serving uh, as an advisor to the Club de Madrid organization that ga gathers uh, actually former uh, heads of state and the government. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter, welcome to Lighthouse uh, Podcast. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, in your keynote address, you mentioned that uh, it is a very bad time for the world, but actually it is a excellent time uh, for researchers. What did you mean by saying that? Well, what I meant and what I was talking about was that a lot of things are changing. A lot of things are developing in ways that we haven't completely figured out. So when you look at extremism, for example, we defeated, or the coalition, global coalition, defeated Islamic State in 2018, 17, 18. It's disappeared in Syria and Iraq, but we don't know yet where it's gone. We don't know yet what's going to come out of it, out of the fall of ISIS, what's going to emerge, what's going to happen with Afghanistan, with the takeover of the Taliban. Will that become a new safe haven? All of these developments are still in flux. We've seen a rise of the far right over the past few years. We've seen attacks from New Zealand to the United States to Europe. They've definitely become more frequent, but we don't know yet how frequent and how powerful that force is going to be. And also, over the past two years during the pandemic, which were exceptional times for most of our countries, we've seen the emergence of a new kind of movement, what I describe as post-pandemic extremism, people who are big fans of conspiracy theories, who've opposed lockdowns, who think that there is a global elite taking over our countries, and that may result in violence too. So these are exciting times if you're studying these phenomena because it's very clear that something new is emerging, but we don't know yet what. And uh, I don't think anyone who pretends to have an answer can be believed because no one quite knows. We will know in three or four or five years. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, that pandemics actually uh, brought to us something new that is emerging. Uh, can you tell us uh, uh, more about uh, how pandemics actually influenced uh, the uh, old forms of extremism? Well, yeah. I think the pandemic was a really profound event for a lot of people in European democracies. Never before have freedoms been suspended, essentially, so dramatically. People weren't even allowed to leave their houses anymore. Um, and a lot of people had a hard time making sense of that. It made them feel very uncertain. They were afraid of the virus, but at the same time, they were fearful about what government might, uh, governments might do to them. And so out of that has come a renewed and very powerful interest in conspiracy theories, because conspiracy theories allow people at times of great uncertainty to make sense of things in a very simplistic way. And so we've seen that sort of movement uh, emerge last year. They had big demonstrations all across Europe. The movement has shrunk a little bit in size, but what has happened, like with other radical movements in the past, 
the people that were left over actually became more hardened and became more radicalized. And what we've seen over the past few months is that these people are developing narratives of resistance. They are preparing to justify violence. And in some cases, in some instances, we've in fact already seen attacks against people. And so I'm very concerned that out of that movement, out of that uncertainty, and out of that pandemic will come uh, a violent extremist movement at some point. You're referring to this new phenomenon that's, that emerged after pandemics mm -hmm. or during pandemics as a movement. Yeah. How coherent this movement is? Is it's, it coherent yeah. or is it, it is a you know, splinter yeah. group? I, I think that's exactly the right question because right now, it's a very um, incoherent movement. There's a lot of people, like people studied, for example, the big demonstrations that ha happened last year. And people asked, how do you consider yourself politically? And maybe 10 to 15% were far right, were extreme right. But the rest of them, a very large number of them, never were involved in political activity at all. It was the first time that they went on the streets. There was also a significant group of people that many people considered to be esoterics, people interested in natural cures and in esoteric movements, also not really political. So we can see that this movement right now is very diverse, very incoherent, and like a lot of social movements like this, over time it will lose a lot of people and it will become more coherent. And Right now, I don't think we can describe this entire movement as a far-right movement, but the far-right is definitely part of it. But in most countries, it doesn't dominate it yet. Do you think that uh, actually in the end, the uh, far-right movement uh, could uh, profit from the pandemics and they can actually sucked in uh, yeah. definitely uh, this... Uh, I think uh, they are trying uh, that. Yeah. They are trying yeah. that. We can see that in places like Austria, for example, where um, the far right has actually taken over the leadership of that movement, mm -hmm. is organizing these demonstrations, is telling people, you should come to us. We are the only revolutionary force in this country. Um, so in Austria, it seems to work. In Germany, for example, it doesn't seem to work. In Britain, where we've also had demonstrations, the far right is a very small part of that movement. So it depends where you look. And that will be, in fact, one of the really interesting things for researchers to look at. What is the influence of the far right within that movement? Are we dealing with an enlarged far right or are we dealing with essentially a new movement, a new cause? And tell me, what is the government doing in this respect? Is it it's silently watching the movement, new movement emerging, or it, what? Well, I can tell you what it should do. I think mm -hmm. for sure it should watch uh, this movement. Um, for sure it should pay attention, very strong attention, to narratives emerging that justify violence. Mm -hmm. um, because that's what we've seen over the past four or five months, that more and more people are saying, it's not enough to go on the street. It's not enough to demonstrate. Nothing will happen anyway. We have to do something else. And we're justified in doing something else because there's a global elite basically trying to take away our freedoms. And if you want to take away our freedoms, we have the right to resist. And these sorts of narratives are becoming more and more popular. And I think it will be very important for governments to understand what are the networks that are propagating these narratives and how can you, if necessary, stop them. When it comes to demonstrations, when it comes to people advocating conspiracy theories, it's really difficult for governments because, and I spoke about that today in the lecture, it's really difficult because it's not a crime to speak nonsense. It's not a crime to say, oh, there's a global elite who are governing us. Maybe that's factually false, but in a way, it's very difficult to ban people from saying stupid things. And that's the same problem that governments have. It's the same problem that, for example, social media providers have. They can take off videos that encourage violence. But very few, very few videos are encouraging violence. They're, they can take off videos that give factually incorrect information about vaccine. 
But most of the videos are not about that. But what you're left with is like a huge number of videos that are encouraging people to believe in conspiracy theories that eventually get them towards violence maybe. Um, and those are the videos that are very difficult to ban because they are rightfully allowed under freedom of speech. And where is uh, is Islamist extremism and terrorism today? Especially after the Taliban took over the power in Afghanistan. I think, yeah, I think it's at a crossroads. I think the, the movement um, for a number of years since the fall of Islamic State in 2018, followers of that movement have been very frustrated, have been very depressed because the caliphate that they were told was going to be a thousand year empire um, has been destroyed within a relatively short period of time. There were no big attacks. There were some smaller attacks, but no big attacks on the scale of what we saw in 2015-16. So quite a few people have become quite depressed about the situation. Quite a few people have left the movement. Very few people have joined the movement. But now, of course, with the takeover of, the, of, of Afghanistan by Taliban, for the first time in a number of years, the movement has a success again. And we can see in the propaganda of Islamist extremists that they are trying to market, that they are trying to sell this as a success of their movement. The question is now whether a lot of people will be inspired by that. And right now, we're not seeing a lot of inspiration happening, but it depends on how the situation develops. If Afghanistan once again becomes a safe haven for terrorist groups, if we see people traveling to Afghanistan, we could see a recreation on a smaller scale of what we see a few years ago. But I will, I will be very cautious about that because I think the big enthusiasm that existed four years ago, or five years ago, or ten years ago, that doesn't exist anymore. So Islamist extremism, to, to give you a short answer, will continue to preoccupy us. It will continue to keep us busy, but I don't think it will return to where it was in 2014-15 when we had an entire country being ruled by it. Okay, and then should we um, uh, worry uh, much uh, more about uh, right-wing extremism? and the rise uh, worldwide, yeah, because we I are think, uh, yeah. witnessing that there is an ongoing rise of right-wing extremism. I think, I think we should be worried about it, but I think we should be even more concerned about how it has changed. Mm -hmm. Because if 10 years ago you told people, uh, what do you imagine when you think of uh, far-right extremists? Uh, you would think of skinheads on the street. You would think of neo-Nazis waving flags and stuff like that. All the attacks that we've seen in recent years, whether it was in Christchurch or in Norway or in America or in Germany, they were carried out not by classical skinheads. They were carried out by individuals who were sitting in front of their computers, who were transnationally networked, who were part of messaging forums like 4chan or 8chan, and who were often socially isolated young men who constructed their own narratives, who were not part of any group, who had no previous involvement in far-right extremism, but who then decided to act on their own and to appeal to a largely virtual audience who posted manifestos on the internet, right? So that was a quite a different type of right-wing extremism from what we had seen 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And I think the security agencies were slow to realize that. Mm -hmm. And how serious is that threat? Because uh, as you mentioned, there is a huge virtual sphere Absolutely. where uh, right-wingers are connecting with each other, so-called channosphere. Exactly. Uh, so how actually these uh, uh, right-wingers uh, and their dissatisfaction with, uh, uh, with, with, with uh, society is translated into uh, real actions? Yeah, so um, I think you're right. Um, there's a lot of people out there, and thankfully, it doesn't translate into action so easily. Otherwise, we would see attacks every day, mm -hmm. and fortunately, we don't see that. But I do think that from time to time, um, this will remain with us. And of course, every attack like this also has the aim and the objective to inspire other attacks. 
just like all of the attacks that happened in recent years, were ultimately inspired by Anders Breivik in Norway in 2011, I think. Um, there may be another Anders Breivik who inspires more attacks. And I think that's why security, my tip to security agencies is that for far too long, they've only spent looking at far-right extremism on the streets, which is important and which they shouldn't stop doing, but they should also look in the internet. They have to be present mm -hmm. on the 4chans and 8chans. They have to be there just like they are on the street. And unfortunately, a lot of police forces, intelligence agencies, they still see the virtual sphere as an extra, as a bonus that you can do, but you don't have to do. Unfortunately, we're now in a situation where the main action happens online and what happens on the street also happens, but it's at least 50-50. Mm -hmm. And do you have uh, any proposal how to make the balance between uh, uh, controlling the internet and uh, so-called genospheres mm -hmm. and not harming the human rights? Well, it's, I'm not so much in favor in the, in, in the terms of the chans. I think it's really difficult to ban anything mm -hmm. because often they are platforms that are not even based in a Western country or in a European country. They are, in the case of 4chan, I think they were based in the Philippines. It was a website run by one person. It's going to be really difficult to, for a government or law enforcement agency to take stuff off. What they can do, however, is, um, and I'm not always making myself popular by saying that, they can infiltrate these websites. Mm -hmm. They can go on these websites. They can participate in conversations. They can watch and monitor conversations. And they can try to make contacts with people basically being undercover. Just like an undercover agent that infiltrates a Nazi group in a little village, I want an undercover cyber agent to infiltrate networks of groups online. That's, I think, what they should do, rather than trying to remove content, which I think is really difficult when you're dealing with these kinds of websites. Yeah. Okay, and what, what is the reason behind the rise of uh, far, far right? Uh, I think it's yeah. I think it's because our societies have become well. Number one, our societies have changed very rapidly, mm -hmm. and this is something that is happening in almost every society in Europe, and it's something that a lot of people have a difficulty making sense of. And secondly, our discourse has become very polarized. Um, it used to be the case that in order to win an election, you had to appeal to the center because that's where most voters were. But I think with the internet, with social media, this has ex to some extent changed and it pays off now to appeal to the fringes, to become more extreme in your statements, to see only black and white and not spell out the nuances anymore and to treat your political opponent almost like he was an enemy. And I think this polarization within society has also had a spillover effect on the fringes of society and has enabled and justified people in thinking that ultimately our society is threatened, is existentially threatened, and that any means is justified to prevent that. And so I think this is something that is, of course, also again enabled by the internet, by social media. Social media cannot be taken away. So we, as democratic societies, have to find a way of dealing with that, have to find a way of having a discourse that is, of course, controversial, but that doesn't become so polarized that nothing holds society to get together anymore. And to what extent uh, uh, huge migration uh, issue has contributed to the rise oh, of far-right. What, what is this your opinion? Is, no, because I think... Uh, in Serbia, it is a big issue. It, yeah. it is becoming a huge problem, yeah. No, I think uh, the, the, the watershed uh, for this uh, particular discourse was 2015-16, uh, the sort of migration crisis, which confirmed or seemed to confirm the narrative on the far-right. The narrative on the far-right was that Western elites are pursuing the so-called great replacement, that they are replacing white European populations with foreign, predominantly Muslim population, that they are essentially interested in destroying their own societies. That is, of course, a conspiracy theory, but 
this conspiracy theory became more plausible and it resonated more in the eyes and in the perception of some people because of the migration that was happening 2015-16. So undoubtedly and unfortunately, yes, it probably was a factor that made that, made that easier. But don't forget, Anders Breivik, uh, that happened in 2011, that happened long before. So these narratives existed long before, the ideology existed long before, and then something happened, something very dramatic and exceptional in 2015-16 that seemed to confirm the narrative in the eyes of a lot of people. And where is the Western Balkans when it comes to uh, extremism? Well, at the center of everything, of course, <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, of course, I mean, um, the Western Balkans are um, the European neighborhood. We want you to be part of the EU very soon. And so in that sense, of course, everyone in Europe is looking at the Western Balkans almost as if it was a part of the European Union. So what happens in your countries is relevant to the rest of the European Union. And the reason why perhaps extremism has even more of a relevance in the Western Balkans is because in a number of countries, um, the balance, the political balance is still very fragile. So let's say, for example, we have ISIS fighters coming back to Bosnia and they commit one or two terrorist attacks. Of course, it's her horrible for the terrorist attacks, but those terrorist attacks would also have an impact on the political balance of power on, and on politics and would probably destabilize uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina very much. And we want to prevent that. And so that's why I always say to people, terrorism is not just about killing five or six people, it's actually about terrorizing a society. It's also about the wider political effect that comes as a result of those terrorist attacks. It's about the attack, of course, you want to stop people from dying, but it's also about the political instability that can come out of terrorist attacks. And unfortunately, in the Western Balkans, you still have a number of states that are not completely stable and where terrorist attacks could have an impact also on the political stability. In your opinion, uh, does uh, uh, Western Balkans governments are trying to misuse uh, the fight against the ter terrorism in, in order to uh, shrink the space for civil society? Or? Well, I think, I, to be honest, uh, right now I don't know enough about the politics, but it wouldn't be... Um, it wouldn't be unusual because a lot of governments are trying to do that. A lot of governments are trying to use uh, terrorism uh, or the threat of terrorism as a political football for their own purposes. Um, they are using it in order to shrink the space for civil society. They are using it in order to portray the opposition as illegitimate. Um, they're using it for their own ends, and one has to be very careful about that. That doesn't mean that there isn't a threat from terrorism, mm -hmm. but you should always be aware of political actors using it for their own purposes. Okay, thank you, Peter, very much for joining us. I hope that we'll have another opportunity to sure. have you again in our podcast. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to thank uh, our viewers for uh, following us and I would like to invite everybody to subscribe to our uh, channel. Uh, until the next episode, uh, goodbye.